Welcome to Reality Bites Radio on the 17th of November 2014. I have a guest tonight, uh, Christina England, who's written um, numerous articles. She's uh, an investigative journalist, I suppose you'd you'd, uh, term you, Christina, and um, author. Um, You... um, we're going, to, we're going to start, there's, there's so many aspects to the vaccination um, issue, uh, including the, the one that you wrote your own book on, the, the shaken baby syndrome, which we can come on to later. Um, but we'll start on the Munchausen syndrome by proxy article you wrote, the medical professions get out of jail free card, with a question mark on it. Um, welcome to the um, Reality Bites, Christina. Good to talk to you again. Um, yes. This article... This, unfortunately, it's, um, it's an updated article because the, the unfortunate child has since died. Um, do you want to take us through this story? Yes, um, I met Ella when she was six. Um, at the time I was brought in and asked if I could help in the case. Um, her mother um, was having problems with the child in hospital. Um, she reported to me that she'd had uh, um, several vaccinations often and after each vaccination. I mean, she was born a perfectly normal, healthy little girl, um, as pictures will sh- show on the article. Um, the article was written um, for medical kidnap. Um, basically, the little girl, every time she had a, re- um, a vaccination, she reacted um, and got worse and worse. Um, her mother didn't cotton on really until she was about four and by that time she was pretty ill and was not doing very well at all. She'd started to lose sort of control of some of her limbs. She was overbalancing, falling flat on her face, this kind of thing. And um, then she had the MMR vaccine at the age of four. And it was at that age where she really, really badly deteriorated and became completely paralyzed from head to toe. And that was around about the time I met Ella. Um, Ella couldn't um, move any limbs at all. She was totally paralyzed. Um, She even needed a tube to help her breathe. And... um, her mother had been trying to get her help and trying to find out what was wrong. When she mentioned the vaccinations to any of the doctors in the UK, um, this was a UK child, um, she uh, was told that it couldn't possibly be the vaccinations, um, she was exaggerating, it was all in her mind, that kind of thing, and that um, it wasn't the vaccinations, um, the child must have an underlying problem. And... Um, the mother was absolutely determined to find out what was going what was going wrong and what was wrong with the child and had taken her to several doctors abroad and each and every one of them stated that she'd had a vaccine injury. Now, I've, at the time I met Ella, I'd, I'd seen three reports clearly stating that she had a vaccine injury. Um, I then managed to get hold of uh, Dr. Harold Bertram who wrote a further report once again stating that it was a vaccine injury um, and that um, she'd only become ill after the vaccines and they were all stating exactly the same thing. Um, Ella was not very well at all. She was, um, as I say, she was paralysed um, completely from head to toe. Um, she was a lovely little girl. I mean, her eyes danced and when you went into the room, her eyes literally lit up and she was trying to, um, the little girl was actually from Iceland and her mother had brought her over here to, to make a better life for them. Um, the, the, other, the other two children that she had, had was going to come over with her husband later on from Iceland and join her in this country. Um, sadly, um, because she was apparently what they call doctor shopping and going from one doctor to another, and because the doctors were obviously saying that she did have a vaccine injury, um, the doctors in the UK weren't happy about that at all. So they um, accused her of doctor shopping and accused her of having suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Munchausen syndrome by proxy is, it is basically um, accusing a parent or mother or caregiver of uh, either making up illnesses um, to get attention from the the medical profession or actually causing injuries in the child purposely to get the medical attention that they they so desire or it um, is uh, where 
parents are accused of doctor shopping and going around and getting more than one opinion. Um, if a parent wants a second opinion, they should never, ever ask for a second opinion. They should always ask for a second medical opinion because otherwise they could be given an opinion from anybody, from, from a bus driver through to a psychiatrist, just about anybody can give a second opinion. Um, but they need to ask for a second medical opinion. This is very important because a lot of families are coming unstuck with this and demanding a second opinion and then getting somebody that's really not qualified to give them the second opinion that they really need. Um, and that happened in another case of mine. Um, Ella went on. Um, she was uh, taken by, by um, the Child Protection Services or social services in our country. And... Um, she was actually put into a residential home. Um, it was more like an institution, and her mother stated at the time that she was very, very unhappy. She was obviously um, crying and just very distressed that she couldn't see her mother. Also, remember, everybody spoke in, in English, and um, she was Icelandic, so she didn't actually understand what they were saying, and it was frightening her, and she was obviously... You know, her mother stated that when she went to see her, she was dirty, she was um, not cared for properly, her feeding tube um, was sort of bunged up with food and what's whatever, and she really wasn't being cared for properly. They didn't seem to be able to care for the cleaning of the tube or cleaning of the um, G button which she had in her stomach um, to feed her with um, nutrients throughout the day. And her mother was very, very worried indeed. She was left in a dirty nappy. And her mother was becoming very distressed as well, seeing her daughter in this state. Um, she stated to me that she couldn't understand why she'd been snatched because she hadn't got a criminal record, had never done anything wrong. She was not negligent. She just loved her child. And the only thing that she may have been guilty of was loving her child too much and trying to get her the help that she needed. Um, I know that one for myself because um, when I, I was falsely accused of Munchausen years ago and my own children uh, were put on the at-risk register and like, like this particular mother, I also was accused of doctor shopping and trying to get you know the help and being overprotective and over-exaggerating the disorders that they had. So um, this is the kind of thing that the doctors do um, and it often comes after a vaccine injury and I've seen it time and time again when parents are accused after a vaccine injury and um, it's a way of covering up the vaccine injury and blaming the parents thus putting the blame onto the, the, the sort of med taking it off of the medical profession and passing it over to the parents making it out all to be their fault and um, you know they've caused the injury they've done this that or the other so this little girl was in a very bad way at that stage um, another fault I think she fought four different court cases and eventually um, won custody of her daughter back and sadly within the year um, Ella was actually doing much better she was improving a lot she'd returned to Iceland However, um, she went to school one day and unfortunately the tube came, uh, her, her breathing tubes came and um, dislodged from her throat and she suffocated to death and nobody actually noticed that the, the tube had come out until it was too late. Um, well, and so she suffered a horrendous death. Yeah, well, I mean, going back to the, uh, the doctors or the um, consultants' reports, uh, there's, there's four... Um, um, sections of these reports uh, on the article. Uh, the first uh, two, two of the reports were written by uh, Sverrir Bergman. Was she That's in right. Iceland at the time? Is that Icelandic yes, one, doctor? One, yeah, yes, he was an Icelandic doctor. One was, um, was written early, um, about two, I can't remember the yeah, years I've got, now. I've, I was just going to read out the, the little sections that are on the site here, actually. That, that first one was written in March 2010. Right. Uh, and she was, I think, I'm, I'm assuming it's a lady, is it? I'm not sure. Um, but she's a um, consultant neurologist. And uh, her diagnosis of Ella was that uh, the condition is on clinical grounds but supported by some investigation as being that of motor sensory polyneuropathy and involving the brainstem nerves as well as the peripheral ones. This has been accepted by others before my involvement in the case and Ella was subsequently given treatment with immunoglobulins and steroids. To me, most likely autoimmune response following vaccination. Uh, suggestive diagnosis of some form of spinal muscular atrophy was never confirmed and later rejected. 
Um, now, the, the second report, uh, there isn't a date on this one, uh, but this, this was this was followed this one, uh, by Shimon Slavin, uh, pro Professor of Medican, sorry, Medicine, Medical and Scientific Director of uh, the International Center for Cell Therapy and Cancer Immunotherapy. Uh, currently, the patient is totally paralyzed with control only over her eyes and eyelids. Today, she is on 24-hour assistance with BiPAP breathing. Uh, I, I take it that's an assisted breathing technique or um, yes. machinery. Um, the patient was seen by various experts on her clinical condition, does not fit any known clinical neurological syndrome. However, careful anamnesis and the development of her symptoms following vaccination suggest a high probability that her current condition may be the consequence of vaccination-induced damage syndrome, uh, VIDS. Uh, in view of a lack of any better suggestion for diagnosis, it appears to me that the option of VIDS is very likely the cause of her, her unusual condition. And then the second report by Sveria Bergman, uh, it was December 2011, approximately, uh, what, uh, 20, 21 months later. Uh, I enclose a copy of my report on Ella. She is severely affected by what is most likely the result of motor sensory neuropathy following immunization. There's much weakness of the limbs and the body, but her brain and nerves are also affected, and she requires direct gastric feeding and breathing assistance, which is not sufficient for her now, and she requires tracheotomy, as there is much swelling in her laryngeal region. And the last report was written by Harold Bertram, MD. Uh, again, there's not a date on this one, but um, I have been gratified to find that hospital and consultant physicians unanimously agreed that Ella uh, was suffering from autoimmune illness. Uh, sort of Ella's autoimmune illness was the result of routine childhood vaccinations, at, with the MMR vaccine being the final agent of incapacitation. Now, th these are all um, would you would think certainly the uh, the consultants are, and the professor of medicine these are all highly qualified people um who were these uh, reports submitted to and um wh well why were they ignored basically they were submitted to all the court cases um and um they were ignored because um for various different reasons they they i don't exactly know why they were ignored but um they they should not have been i've taken those quotes directly from the reports um, that I was given by the mother. Um, we couldn't understand why the reports were kept being ignored, but this is a frequent occurrence um, in cases and reports are ignored. They're either from doctors abroad or they state that um, the doctor is retired or they, they, they can make up all kinds of excuses, everything from, oh, the doctor's been investigated by such and such a board of directors um, again, once a doctor seems to sort of speak out against vaccinations, they can often find themselves reported to the governing body. Um, this has happened to Dr. Wayne Squire, um, a doctor from the UK, and several other doctors as well. I think um, uh, Dr. Marta Cohen has also been through the GMC, uh, that's the General Medi Medical Council, and they are, they are reported by various different people. Um, and brought up before their governing body, usually on professional misconduct or other other such like causes. I mean, um, one one professional I know personally uh, was um, accused of being paranoid um, because um, she was asked to send paperwork in for her case uh, that was not necessary because they'd actually changed the um, without telling her they'd actually changed what the case was so um, and she sent in um, although she'd been asked for that particular paperwork when she sent it in it was not deemed necessary and they said that was um, symptoms of her paranoia um, and I was actually a witness um, a, a witness to that case um, and actually went to the BPS myself which is the British Psychological Society so in, in terms of uh, who's defending these cases obviously the, the big pharmaceutical companies are in there defending um, vaccinations, I, I would assume. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this is, this is exactly what goes on. And, um, you know, everybody is in there and the vac vaccinations are the sacred cow and nobody should ever question the vaccinations. Um, one of those doctors, I'm not sure which one it was, I have got it on the original article, which went out um, in 2012, I believe, uh, on Back Truth about this little girl. Um, in the article, she was called Emma because she was going through court. The, the cases were going through court at the time, so I had to change her name to Emma. But her name is Ella. And, um, I mean, very, I 
can't remember what I was going to say now, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, um, various different things had happened. And one of the doctors, um, one of the doctors that was involved and had written a report uh, was hounded and reported uh, several times to governing bodies. And sadly, he had a heart attack and died. We have no idea if, if it was a result of the continual hounding, uh, but it was certainly a contributory factor. Well, uh, or just a coincidence, eh? Um, yeah. <laughs> again, um, going to the Munchausen syndrome by proxy, I mean, in, in the article it explains, you know, briefly what it is, uh, and um, but there is no, uh, as it says here, no consistent agreement on on whether it even exists or not. And yes, that's right. Um, several doctors say, because others say it doesn't exist, um, the sort of band of doctors like um, Louise Lasher and Dr. Mark Fellman absolutely state exists. Others say, you know, they say um, it's a personality disorder. Others say, no, it can possibly be. Um, certainly Lord uh, Frederick Howe from the House of Lords has stated for many years that it's not a, a personality disorder. And the reasoning for, for calling it a personality disorder is so that it fits nicely into the DSM-5, um, I believe it is. And, um, you know, if, the, if it's a personality disorder, then it's easier to, to actually accuse the parents and, and to win a case. Um, so, I mean, very, I've, I've actually just finished a book, uh, and I can't say too much about the book, but it is going to, is, it's going to be published very, very soon, and it states the history, the whole of the history and the background of the Munchausen syndrome by proxy, and how um, certain people um, have come in and were actually, actually involved in vaccination programs and involved in the government um, sort of guidelines. Um, setting out the guidelines for the vaccinations and yet at the same time falsely accusing parents and saying that the vaccinations can't possibly cause the illnesses even though they know full well that they can. And I've actually used all the government paperwork. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the UK government's got a vaccine damage um, payment scheme, so and that, that's really all you need to know about uh, whether they're safe or not. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very easy to, to divert attention away from the vaccines and, and blame the parents. And as, oh, yes. as you've pointed out before in your, your previous one of your, or your, maybe your, I think it was possibly your first book on the shaken baby syndrome, uh, that's it's another thing that's used to blame the parents and divert attention away from the, the fact that these are, these um, children have been brain damaged by vaccines. It's just another it's another tool that the big pharma companies are, are quite prepared to use um, to point the finger at the parents rather than, than themselves. Yes, and it can have devastating effects on the family. Um, the families can be torn apart. Um, obviously, children are dying, and children are uh, becoming very sick and disabled from from the vaccinations. Um, the parents are being accused of shaken baby syndrome. The children, the remaining children, if there are any, are taken into care and um, go on to be adopted. Um, sometimes the injured children also um, are taken and and put up for adoption. And parents find themselves in jail. I've actually um, actually completed um, a video today, which should be out hopefully on medical kidnap in the very near future. Um, clearly showing, um, I think it was four or five cases where um, parents have been accused of either murder or injuring their child. All of them after vaccination inj injuries, and um, each in, in each case um, they've got different consequences. I've got one, two actually in America at the moment that I've, I actually am working with and know well and both of those cases um, the father has been locked up for murder uh, for life without parole and one particular case, Brian Terrio, has been in prison now for 20 years and we've now got reports clearly showing that the child had an autoimmune disease and probably should never have been vaccinated in the first place. And these are reports from top professionals. Well, again, going back to um, highly qualified doctors and consultants, and as you say, you know, top professionals. Um, it, it, what, I mean, there's a, there's a judge sitting there, presumably, at these cases, uh, hearing all this evidence. And, uh, I mean, are the judges bought off? Because they can't be stupid. Uh, they, I mean, 
are they in the pocket of big pharma as well? In your opinion, I mean, allegedly, I, I, I don't know what the correct word to use is, but um, it, there seems to be some kind of disconnect between uh, evidence and, and, you know, I mean, they, they can't deny the more of these cases they see um, that something's wrong. And I, I was talking to Alan Watt the other day there uh, about doctors in general, just um, GPs. Uh, they, they must see the results of um, vaccine-damaged children all the time coming back into their surgeries. Uh, and they, they must know the cause of it, but they still continue to, to give vaccinations. I mean, the, the evidence is on the vaccine insert itself. Uh, and I've, I've read out on air the um, a while ago when they, they, um, there was a case in the British media regarding a whooping cough vaccine given to a lady uh, making her very sick. And then you look at the, the insert for the, the whooping cough vaccine, I think it was... Um, I can't remember the name, but there's two of them anyway, uh, two of these vaccines getting used at the moment. And in it, it clearly states that uh, no animal testing has been done on these, these products and they've never been tested on, on pregnant women at all. And it actually says in the vaccine insert that they do not know if it damages the fetus. So how, how can a doctor with any conscience uh, give that to a pregnant mother? It, I mean, it's, it's, it's criminal. It is criminal. It is criminal, um, especially um, in the cases of the. You said, like you know, do the judges sit and listen to the evidence? A lot of the evidence is not allowed to be shown in court. The actual fathers are not allowed to give evidence themselves to defend themselves, um, or their uh, anybody that they have on their defence team, um, any any witnesses they may have. Um, are not allowed to speak and I, I know this from personal experience we've got one case in the UK um, where Darrell Elliott was uh, recently jailed for the murder of his daughter shortly after an MMR vaccination and it's, it's now been proved that the child had an underlying condition and um, the, the, the doctor that's proven that is Dr Michael Innes he's very very high up in the profession he's well respected and yet his evidence was not allowed to be shown um, or heard at the time and the, there was no witnesses were allowed to speak he wasn't allowed to speak the father himself and it was only a one-sided case and all the other evidence was uh, dumbed down and they weren't allowed to give any evidence the doctors they had lined up to help um, and to give expert witness statements weren't allowed to speak because one of them um, was one that um, had been um, the forced the accused and and look and sort of accused of um, professional misconduct and had been at the GMC and was she wasn't allowed to speak and yet she'd given a very good report outlining this child's problems and where where what had gone wrong in this case so um, it, it's just a cover up from beginning to end and 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 this starts in the doctor's surgeries where the doctor does know that the child has probably, you know, he doesn't know for certain, but he's got a very, very good idea. A child, you know, comes in, is vaccinated, often a sick child um, who will be vaccinated, and a couple of days later, the parents are saying, you know, the child is not well, the child is, you know, having fits and seizures, and he'll say, and, and they'll say to them, you know, the, the mother will say to the doctor, you know, this only began when my, my child was vaccinated. And they say, oh, it's quite normal to have a fit or a seizure after a vaccination, um, you know, and they list sort of side effects. And they'll say things like, um, oh, it's quite normal for the child to have a high fever or rash. This is not normal. This is very definitely not normal to have a seizure or a rash or a temperature after a vaccine. Your child goes in often perfectly well and ends up having a rash and, and fevers and aching limbs and coming out a very sick child indeed. I mean, and this, this they say is for the health and the well-being of the child. Well, I can't see that. Well, I mean, any, anything that causes distress to the child, uh, whether it's simply the the, you know, the, the pain of the needle going in uh, can't be good. Uh, that, that's going to cause stress. That's, that's going to lower the immune system for a start. Um, the, the fact that uh, in most cases, I would imagine, there is there's swelling on the, the, the injection area, uh, which tells you right away there's something wrong. Um, and, and the doctors must know this. And uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know what kind of um, people are going into the profession. Uh, these days, but the, the certainly um, it seems to be a hypocritical oath they sign these days, uh, because it's certainly not a Hippocratic one, um, because as, as I say, they, they must know that they're damaging these children, and and, and not just uh, the children, um, we'll come on to another case later, uh, where the lady uh, was given uh, vaccinations when she was pregnant, 
uh, which cause problems. Um, and as I say, these, these uh, vaccinations have never been tested on pregnant women, and uh, they clearly state that they don't know if it damages the fetus. So uh, the, the, you have, that begs the question, how did they ever pass any type of safety test if they've never been tested? Yes, I mean, um, the HPV vaccine is a very, very good one um, I've been looking at today. Um, I mean, it's been causing um, ladies to um, go in, well, sort of even young women, even sort of teenagers, um, to stop menstruating and to go into a premature uh, menopause um, within weeks of having the vaccination. And... Um, they they become infertile. Um, this is a case. I mean, Dr. Lucia Tomajenovic has done a paper recently where she studied the cases of three women who'd gone into premature um, menopause. Um, another case, another um, example is a paper by Dr. Deirdre Little, um, which is on the B BMJ. Um, she stated her case of a 14-year-old um, that went into premature um, menopause. This is not normal, and it's you know if they've had a vaccination, um, then it's more than likely that it was the vaccination that caused it, especially if it's just happened sort of days or weeks after the vaccination. Um, and these women are having terrible side effects. They're having, I mean, I was looking at papers today, and they they have suffering blood uh, blood clots and death. They're having Guillain Barr syndrome, um, seizures. There's so many. Um, sort of different adverse reactions after the HPV vaccines and still they persist to um, mandate them in some states of America and persist in the young girls having them. And young girls of the age of nine are having them. And yet the paperwork states clearly that they haven't tested them um, to see how long the vaccination lasts. They don't know if the vaccination causes cancer. They don't know if the vaccination is safe in pregnant women. And, and the list goes on and on. Um, I, there was paper, young girls that had been covered with warts all over their face after, after the vaccination. And yet parents are not made aware of this. And it's only when papers come out and articles, hopefully, like I write and other people write, um, Susan Humphreys, Dr. Susan Humphreys, she writes some brilliant papers on various different vaccinations, as do many, many other doctors and authors and journalists out there who are beginning to see, that, you know, like Dr. Um, not Dr. Sorry, um, Leslie Carroll Botha, she writes many papers on her website, and she's a health, um, a woman's health educator. And she's been writing a lot on, on the HPV vaccinations and premature um, menopause and several, several different things. Um, these, these professionals are speaking out and yet they're being ignored. Why are they being ignored? Well, uh, the big pharma companies have got too much money uh, to lose and uh, too much money to invest in judges, I guess, uh, allegedly. Um, the, the HPV, it's interesting. I read an article last week on air uh, that they were really hammering the fact that uh, boys need to get this now, uh, despite the fact that there's no chance of getting cervical cancer, um, because they, they could catch it by, by kissing. Um, so, I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous. But uh, my uh, my girlfriend here was telling me in, in the States that uh, the the uptake of Gardasil has plummeted and so of course they're not making as much money as they'd like to so they need to force it on boys now I guess. Um, the, I had this out with a doctor actually in Ireland on, on air on one of the local Irish stations over there and this doctor was um, an MP as well, the equivalent of an MP over there at TD and he, he was a guy who was an alcoholic and had driven up the wrong side of the motorway. Um, <laughs> And he, he called me dangerous for pointing out that, um, you know, boys didn't have a cervix and they had no need to take HPV. And the fact that, uh, you know, I, I went through um, the, the different vaccines and, you know, when, when the vaccine had come in and when, you know, when they, um, right at the bottom of the, the cycle of diseases that were, the vaccine came in and it started going back up again. And I asked him how many um, strains of HPV were. I didn't even know. He said 40 or 50. I said, well, it's about 120 as far as I'm aware, and uh, the vaccine only covers two or three. So, you know, which ones is it? You know, what are you vaccinating against? And he couldn't answer. His only answer was uh, to say that it was dangerous having me on the radio. And yet this guy had driven up the wrong side of the motorway, uh, drunk out of his mind. <laughs> but, well, he's you know, a reliable person then, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, you could, you could take him into court, and I'm sure Big Pharma would have a, a place for him. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, FDA or the CDC probably 
fit in nicely with those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, we'll go to a piece of music and then we'll move on to another uh, topic. I, I, I really want to talk about that one with the, the lady who got the vaccines earlier. And there's, it's a whole um, series of events um, going through. Um, I can't, I've, got, I've got it here. That was a case of case or... I'll, I'll get it up in a minute, but uh, my computer's on a bit slow here. Um, so we'll go to a piece of music. Listening to Awake Radio. Straight talk for the awake and aware. Welcome back to Reality Bites on the 17th of November 2014 uh, with our guest Christina England uh, discussing uh, vaccine damaged children uh, basically and the, uh, how can I put it, the, the corruption of the medical profession really um, because uh, I don't think it's uh, it's really there to help when it can do things like this and um, knowingly do it. Um, we are talking off air, uh, Christina, about this case of the vaccine injured child kidnapped by Family and Child Protective Services. Uh, it's on Fact Truth, which uh, you're a contributor to, and written by Augustina Ursino uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, it's the case of Kaser Lee Harris, uh, who was born on Christmas Day, 2013. Um, and this is this is from the mother's uh, this is the mother's own words. I have a son named Kaser Lee Harris. He was born on December 25th, 2013. He is my Christmas miracle. I've been praying for years to have a child on Christmas Day. It's all I ever wanted. When they told me my son was due on January 28th, I knew he wouldn't be born that day. I got the flu and hepatitis B vaccines during pregnancy at 34 weeks and then had him at 35 weeks. My doctor told me I needed to get them. I remember because they were talking about if I had contracted either illness for any reason, they didn't want the baby to get it. I mean, that I'll, I'll stop. It goes on a little bit more. Um, but it, it begs the question, if um, they didn't want the baby getting an illness um, and they're supposedly vaccinating the mother against hepatitis B and the flu, then obviously... They're, they're pre-vaccinating the baby before it's even born because the baby is going to get that as well while he's in the womb. Yes, that's right. Um, I mean, I did an article. I mean, that particular one was very good because it was actually the mother wrote most of the article. Um, Paula made, I'm sorry, um, the girl, Augustine, is it Augustine? She made a couple of um, different comments uh, at the beginning at the end, but the large part of the article was written by the mother. And it is a very, very sad case indeed. Um, the doctors are vaccinating pregnant mothers, and um, it's particularly with the flu vaccination. Um, and the babies are suffering. Um, in another paper, I think it was about a year ago, maybe two years, it might have been 2011, um, where I actually um, was taking um, the work from Dr. Paul King and Eileen Dunneman, uh from NARCO, um, the National Coalition of Organised Women. And she, um, the paper, they were looking at um, the adverse reactions um, after the flu vaccine during pregnancy. And they actually said that on the VIA's website, the um, actual miscarriages and damage to the fetus, uh, largely miscarriages, when it had gone up uh, by 4,250% um, over the couple of years. And they were, I think they were looking back, at, um, up, back as far as 2009. Um, and this was a very, very interesting article and what they were, what um, was trying to be covered up. And um, I mean that is an awful lot of miscarriages, and this it's basically the flu vaccine was causing these parents to mis this, these mothers to miscarry. And um, I've read some terrible, very harrowing um, accounts of mothers who have miscarried and what they went through um, during the process. Um, several of them had to have um, actually uh, gave birth to stillborn babies and. Um, it was it was very harrowing some of the actual um, reports that I'd read on one one website, and um, this is this is kind of thing that goes on. Should parents have um, vaccinations during pregnancy? After all, they're not allowed to have any. You know, they're advised not to have alcohol. They're advised not to have any um, drugs, even paracetamol, during pregnancy. But oh, the vaccines are perfectly safe. Let's give them all the vaccines we can. Well, of course, the 
they're now coming out in the press and saying that if you drink during pregnancy, you could be charged with a crime. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, but, but it's okay to take mercury, you know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's, I mean, the, vaccines, but, uh, the vaccines include, uh, especially the flu vaccines, it, it's got mercury, um, not mercury, sorry, aluminium. Tamerosol as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, I haven't looked up the actual ingredients recently, but I know because I've written loads and loads of uh, work on the aluminium in the vaccinations and what that can do. And uh, it, that can cause um, damage to the cells and damage to various parts of the body, um, the aluminium um, alone. And the aluminium is in about six or seven vaccinations at the moment, currently being given to children. And it's, it can actually, the aluminium in vaccines has been found to actually cause, at a later date in life, um, um, early onset Alzheimer's disease. It can also cause heart attacks. There are so many things that aluminium can actually um, cause when vaccinated into the human body. It's not supposed to be vaccinated into the human body. Yeah. Well, I mean, they actually banned aluminium pots in the, in the United States for cooking because it was so yeah. bad for you. And yet, yet they're quite happy to inject it into to pregnant mothers. Um, and to, uh, is, is there any evidence to suggest that, that mothers who are vaccinated uh, result in having premature children? Um, yes, premature births is, is largely um, uh, one of the side effects, um, having a child early. Um, that's if the child should survive at all. Um, the child's children are often damaged. Um, many of them are born very, very prematurely. And then, of course, when they're born prematurely, they still have the vaccinations on, uh, the, from their birth date, the day they were born. Not the actual um, date they should have been born, but the date they are actually born, they have eight weeks and then they're vaccinated. Now, um, often with nine vaccinations in one day, and I've written many, many articles on this, um, uh, most of the children do not do well after, well, the ones that I've come across anyway, have not done well after receiving nine vaccinations in one day, especially if you consider the, the sort of toxins and poisons and chemicals that are in these vaccinations and the, the fact that the babies are often still in their incubators. Um, they, off, they have many things wrong. They can have immature lungs. Um, the brains, sometimes the brains aren't, the blood vessels in the brains aren't fully developed and can bleed very easily. They have eye problems, um, various different pro problems that go with the premature babies. Now, if you vaccinate those, and I mean, some of the babies nowadays that survive are born at 24 weeks. So this means if they're vaccinated at eight weeks, that is when they are actually minus eight weeks and not plus eight weeks. And um, of course, many of these children children don't survive. Um, I've had two twins, um, of different twins, they were, one was a boy from one set of twins and one was a girl from another set of twins, who were very poorly babies, that were very weak, they were having lots of problems in the incubators. They were both vaccinated um, with the eight, they had eight vaccinations, I think one had eight and one had nine vaccinations in one day, and both of the babies subsequently died, um, and both parents were accused of you know, um, causing the injuries um, that the child sustained. Um, one was accused of shaken baby syndrome and lost his other twin, um, a little boy called Dalton, and he went into care for, I believe, a year before he got him back. And so he actually lost the care of his child. Um, and this is, this is being reported all over the place where children are being kidnapped, having vaccine injuries and then being kidnapped and the parent loses custody, and often the children go on to be adopted. Yeah, I just want to continue with the story. We'll read through it, and uh, I mean, there's so many aspects of the story that uh, need um, addressing. Um, okay, we've, we've done a bit where she, she gets the flu vaccinations um, at 34 weeks, and then she, she has a baby at 35 weeks. Um, but uh, immediately after the vaccination, she says, I knew something was off after the shots, but no one would listen. I did not connect the dots, though. When my body started hurting, I started walking around to try and stop the pain. It helped a little. That morning, my waters broke at 5.30 a.m. I went to the hospital and gave birth to my son at 12.41 a.m. on Christmas morning. Um, during labour, I was given two epidurals, but neither of them worked, although the pain wasn't bad. They then gave me pitocin to speed up the process. My son's breathing slowed too much, so they stopped the pitocin. Uh, as soon as I had him, they took him and gave him the hepatitis B vaccine. 
even though he was born five weeks premature and I was vaccinated for flu and hepatitis B less than a week before. So he's, he's got two doses of uh, hepatitis B vaccine within a week. Um, <laughs> right afterwards, he became jaundiced and was in a, a billy blanket for a week, a billy blanket I presume to keep him warm. Um, a few days, at, or, or hydrated, or, or whatever, or both, uh, a few days after he was born, I got sick. The doctors gave me a steroid that dried up my breast milk. Uh, I tried to relactate with no luck. Then our baby started to get sick. He was on soy formula at the time and was spitting up a lot of his bottles. I mean, soy is not fit for human consumption. So, no, exactly. Uh, uh, you know, and he, he's, he's not getting breast milk. I'm sure, there, I mean, well, I know that there are um, banks of um, human breast milk where you know, you can you can go and get it. Um, one week we we got snowed in, and in the and the closest gas station only had milk formula. So we tried it. He almost stopped breathing after the first bottle. Uh, we tried to tell the doctor about his reactions to the formulas, but with no results. So I mean, the doctors don't even listen to that. Although they all know that breast milk is best. Um, so I started feeding him rice cereal and baby food. He was so hungry, he would cry when I didn't feed him fast enough. This was around eight to ten weeks old. I didn't know that there were milk banks where mothers donate the milk. I wish I had. Uh, it's two months checkup. Uh, bear in mind, as, as you mentioned, he's premature, so he's, he's, it's not quite two months. He's five, he's five weeks behind that. Uh, he was given Hep B again, so that's the third one he's had. Um, HIB, DTAP, IPV, PCV, and Rota. Uh, the doctor did not adjust the vaccine schedule for him, even though he was born five weeks early. He still got the shots any normal two two months uh, old would get. As the months went by, his condition worsened, and even before then, he was only nine pounds seven ounces. And through it all, they still vaccinated him. Second dose of HIV, PCV, IPV, DTAP and Rota were given at his four-month checkup, well, it's, at which point he's, he's only uh, two months and three weeks. Uh, during these months, I had taken him to the ER nearly uh, nearby several times. They said nothing was wrong and sent him home. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of doctors they have in the emergency room uh, where they'll, they'll send a baby home several times who's um, vomiting and uh, clearly not well. Uh, he started to lose weight at five months. At this time, he was deemed failure to, to thrive. So, in, in other words, he's, um, he's, he's on the path to death, really. Um, when he was almost six months old, he was puking so much. As you said, this, this lady wrote the article herself, so these are her own words. Uh, we were really concerned. Kesar started puking up everything he ate. Uh, I called his doctor, and she told me to take him to the hospital in town, and she would send him paperwork to have him moved to the children's hospital immediately. Now, I'm in mind she's been at the emergency room several times already and yet uh, a letter from the doctor is supposed to solve all that. Um, I took him to the nearby emergency room at uh, Ozark Health Medical Center in Clinton, Arkansas, uh, the same place I'd taken him numerous times before. Then we were taken by ambulance to Arkansas Children's Hospital in Little Rock. After a week at the Children's Hospital we were able to take Kaser home and during that time he turned six months old on June 25th, 2014. Uh, we were home for about a week when the Department of Human Services, the DHS, had, it's interesting that's the same acronym as the Department of Homeland Security, but uh, there you go, mm -hmm. uh, showed up for their first visit. They were in and out fast and didn't show much interest. We had just gotten him to smile for the first time because they finally changed his formula to Nutra Megan. He started to grow a little and was trying to roll over. Uh, that same week after he came home and DHS first visited, we took him for his six-month checkup and the doctor gave him six-month shots, influenza, DTAP, HIV, PCV and Rota. He was vaccinated on schedule even though he'd been puking before his shots and just kept getting worse after these latest ones. Uh, then the DHS lady came back the next week to take him uh, on July 9, 2014. I didn't know they were making a claim to take our son away. During this visit, she kept making excuses to take our son. She walked through the house alone, asked to use the restroom and tore up the bedroom connected to it. Uh, she told us to pack his stuff and give him to her. Um, now, I, we had a case uh, in the UK where, where this happened um, and, and the excuse for taking the child was that um, refusal to vaccinate and the, the social workers yeah, came, you, came you, into you the can't, house. You can't win. No, you can't win, no. But the, again, like, like this, I, I don't know if they're training the same way across the world, but the, I, as I say, this, this is an, an American case I'm, I'm reading out here, but this case was in the, the UK where the, the social workers came in, uh, there was a child minder there because the parents were working. Um, they went up to the child's bedroom, uh, ransacked that, and then went into the parents' bedroom and searched that as well. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, this is this is exactly the same system we're seeing in this case, um, and it seems to be the way they're trained these days. They just seem to think they can walk into people's homes and do what they like. Um, yes, they do, and they yeah, they they can usually uh, just walk into your home 
Um, I had one family who had their children taken away at the son's birthday party. Um, this was another little girl. That the parents had been falsely accused of shaken baby syndrome. Um, the, all three children were taken away at little boy's birthday party. They were all playing in the paddling pool and they were taken away screaming, soaking wet, in, not even got nappies and the mother was not even allowed to go and get them dry clothes or nappies. Um, she was just literally brushed aside and no matter how much the mother screamed and she told me at the time that she screamed so much her nose bled because you know her children were being taken away it was another four years before they she she got those children back and um it was found in her case it wasn't uh, it wasn't a vaccine injury um it was a short fall injury the child had actually been laying on the floor uh on a changing mat and the little brother had tripped over her and banged her head with his head and it was classed like a shortfall and um, the, uh, the, the she had the shaken baby term C triad in her brain um, there was bleeding to the brain swelling to the brain and bleeding behind the eyes and they, they said that the parents had um, been shaking her so badly that her brain um, bled and uh, she 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 did she's doing very well now I've, I've actually met that little child as well although she's a Canadian child I have met her at one of the conferences that the parents were running and I, I was speaking at and yeah she's she's doing exceptionally well um, and she's back with the right in the rightful place with her parents now um, but that was a very very sad case and this is happening all over the, all over the the world. It's not just UK, it's America, it's um, Canada, it's New Zealand, Australia, um, even South Africa and India. These children have been stolen from parents after vaccine injuries. Well, I mean, c carrying on with this story, it, it gets worse. Yeah, it <laughs> if does get if worse. It's, if it's possible. One. Yeah, um, okay, we'll carry on. Uh, when she told me to give her my baby, I couldn't do it. I stood there crying, staring at my baby. My mother-in-law had to do it. She didn't have she didn't have a warrant. So the social worker doesn't have a warrant to take the child in the first place, or presumably any paperwork that's uh, got any legitimacy to it. Um, my fiancé and I practiced things. I only helped because I knew what he needed. He was always so sick and fragile. I never let him out of my sight. I'm 22. We're both pretty young, and it was very hard. Now, that in itself is, uh, is possibly a reason why they, they went after this particular child, because the couple was very young and uh, possibly naive in terms of uh, not actually um, stopping the vaccinations when they saw there was harm caused in the first place or in the first instance. Um, I, I don't know, if there, is there any kind of evidence to suggest they go after younger parents rather than people who are possibly in their 30s or 40s who actually um, have a bit of common sense? I've seen it right, right across all different ages um, and all different walks of life. I've seen um, parents accuse um, even a lawyer, I know of a lawyer that was falsely accused in the UK, um, you must know this one as well, Sally Clark. Um, I mean, it goes on and on and on. Um, it doesn't matter what walk of life you are in. What, and if, if you have any kind of criminal record in your past, this is brought up and used against you as well um, I've had one of the, one of the gentlemen that fathers that I've, I actually know um, had um, a drug related crime in his teenage years and he, he was about 26 when he got accused but um, that was all put, brought up in court um, he had uh, drugs for years it was in his teenage years um, these things happen and kids kids will be kids um, I mean, there's several cases. Another one had um, another kind of crime. I think it was a stealing of a car. And once again, it was used against him in court. Oh, he's got a, prim a criminal record, this, that and the other. He's been doing this. He's done this. You know, can he be trusted? Um, and again, it was used against him and he was jailed. So uh, this is happening all over the place. Um, and it doesn't matter what walk of life you're from. It really doesn't. Right, well, we'll carry on. Um, we didn't know the doctors reported seeing bruises when we took them in. Now, you would you would imagine, um, like if, if you've you've been con you've been consistently taking this child to the emergency room at the hospital, um, somebody would have noticed there was bruises and and, and you know pointed it out or or mentioned it even. Um, but never once did they admit vaccines cause these reactions. Now, of course, it, most children get the vaccine have swelling at the, the vaccine as we mentioned and, and possibly bruising. Uh, any kind of injection can cause bruising. 
Um, Kayser's dad, my fiancé, uh, was accused of abuse. Uh, we were both interrogated and threatened with jail time. Uh, what right they had to threaten him with uh, anything uh, without any um, proper trial or evidence uh, is is uh, um, harassment, I would have thought. But anyway, uh, the DHS worker that came was determined to take him. She stayed at the house for five hours looking for a reason to take him. She did a lot of illegal things that we couldn't get her in trouble for. Uh, after she took him, she had to do a skeletal stand, scan the following Monday at one of the hospitals. Now, this is the following Monday, so she's assumably had him for a few days at this point. And um, his sixth and seventh left ribs were broken. We had no idea what had happened. Now, you'd, I mean, I've, I've had broken ribs, and uh, it's very, very painful. It's very difficult to breathe without, um, you know, wincing. Um, and you would imagine if this child had um, two broken ribs on his on his left side, that um, they would have known before uh, he was taken away. That's for sure. Um, the first thing she did when she took him was block all of his records and cut all con contact with his doctors, so I have no access to his records. So again, she couldn't even um, prove that he had broken ribs, I would, I would assume, if she had no access to any medical records. Um, she also told my mother all the information on her case. Uh, my mother knew about his injuries before I did, and my mum wasn't part of, the, part of the case. What she did was illegal. Uh, after case, case was taken, they wouldn't let his dad come to the visits until he took a paternity test. Uh, it took a month or so for that process to complete. It was sad for all of us. Now Kesa watches his dad wherever he goes and gets upset if he's not there. Um, then I started to notice he was getting sick again. Uh, possible seizures, I believe I have seen him uh, start to have. Um, we noticed at the visits he wouldn't smile anymore. He slept through most of the visits. I found out they had stopped feeding him rice cereal and baby food. They were only giving him bottles and it was affecting him. He is now 10 months old. I know they continue to vaccinate him, but I don't know which ones at this point because his records were blocked for me. Now, again, um, there has to be um, parental consent vaccines. So how, how can they give a child um, vaccines without the parent's consent unless they've taken over the role of the parent? This is it, but they can. They can give them without their consent. Um, vaccinations are being given at school without parents' consent at the moment. So, um, you know, they go in, the children go in in the morning and get vaccinated. Um, the, I mean, the parents losing the medical records or having them, you know, lost for them, uh, this is very, very normal in these cases. Um, medical records go missing or the parents are banned from seeing them, um, stop is put on them, um, all this kind of thing. So this, this is quite, quite normal. Um, it doesn't sound normal to a, you know, a sort of an average intelligence person like you or me, but I mean, it's normal for what the social services do. And this is what, exactly how they play it. Um, they just take over the rights of the parent and the parent has no more say in the child's care or well-being and they try as soon as possible to terminate all parental rights to the child. Um, this has happened in several cases that I've been working on. So as soon as they can, they get hold of the child and they um, stop all the medical records, stop the parent from being able to get hold of anything. They try and lessen and lessen the visits. Um, they can only have uh, visits that are supervised. They can't have visits um, that are unsupervised, so the, the parent never gets to be alone with the child. And as you were saying about the broken ribs, um, vaccines can actually cause broken ribs. Um, if you look at my, I look up back truth and look up my name and look up tissue scurvy, um, I've got an article with a child that looks as if it's been battered, you know, completely black and blue. Um, and the father was falsely accused and jailed. And it turns out that the child had tissue scurvy, which it can be caused by the vaccinations. And it's very different from the sea, sea service um, sort of uh, scurvy. It's actually um, an abundance of vitamin C within the blood, blood but the blood is blocked from uh, the vitamin C is blocked from getting to um, the cells of the body, and the body uh, body cell breaks down, which causes the bruising and, and the swelling um, on the on the limbs and the broken bones in several cases. And um, it's just uh, the it's um, the vaccinations have stopped the actual pancreas from working, so the pancreas is not uh, producing the insulin, and it's uh, a very nasty illness, and it can often be called Kariaki syndrome as well. Um, and 
there is a paper on there and I've explained it all in detail. I've explained about this particular case where Dr. Michael Innes actually wrote a report with one of the several doctors that wrote a report and the, uh, the guy that was jailed uh, was actually released from prison about six years later um, on the evidence given in those reports. Hmm. Okay, well, uh, carrying on with this... Um <laughs> horrendous Sorry, story. Right? It's this horrendous story. I, I mean, there's, there's so many aspects to it. It's just uh, it's, it's worth going through the whole thing. Um, since he was taken at six months old, they've done a number of tests on him: MRI, EEG, etc. They found bleeding in his brain and damage behind his eyes. Now, this is after he's taken. Uh, he weighs 17 pounds nine ounces now. That's still small for his age. He weighs about as much as a six, seven-month-year-old. Now. This is, this is the bit that I would kind of think is this is a bit strange. Uh, his foster parents reported seeing him having staring spells often, which I've seen him have as well. They said it looked like shaken baby syndrome. So then the police came in. We were interrogated and told we should tell the truth because he had been abused. And if we didn't, we would go to jail. Well, how can, how can the, the foster parents not be responsible for this? If, if they, yeah, they've had the baby. That's you know? it. Uh, they, so will never be, they will never be accused. It's always going to be the parents that are going to be accused. And, um, you know, this happens time and time again. Um, they'll, they'll say that the abuse happened before the foster parents have actually had the care of the child. Um, but it's clear that in this case that, it, that the pair, foster parents could have had something to do with it. But, of course, it will be the parents that will be blamed because they were the ones that were stating that there was a problem after the vaccines. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, the doctor's reports came back a week or so ago and advised that while his injuries looked bad, they don't prove he was abused. So, I mean, at that point you think, okay, it doesn't prove he's been abused, so hand them back. Um, but we still have things to finish in our case plan and hope this will be over soon. Uh, Children's Hospital is, is the one saying his injuries aren't proof of abuse. He had his six-month shots after being released from Children's, the Children's Hospital, uh, and that would be why he acted sick after they took him too. And then subsequent vaccines he was given are making him sick even more. Uh, people ask why I got vaccinated while pregnant. And, and this, is, this is where I, I talk about people being young and not actually, you know, understanding what's happening to them. Yeah. Uh, I always thought it was required. Now, it's, it's, it's put out there that, you know, you have to get these things. And it's put out there also that your children have to get them. It's kind of um, implied uh, that it's mandatory. And, you know, young, young people will just take that as gospel because it's, it's, it's a doctor telling them that. You know, yeah. and and it, it goes on. I, I didn't know be, getting vaccinated while pregnant could cause me to go into labour or risk me losing my baby. I didn't question anything at the time. I didn't really question anything until after Casey was taken. Uh, I trusted them stupidly, yes, but I did. Uh, we both did. We just never knew this could happen. Not until my grandma told us what she knew and that vaccinations could do this. Then I looked into it. Um, she sent me some printouts and I read through them. It makes you wonder why grandma didn't tell her um, before she got the vaccinations in the first place, but uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, but um, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I've, I've tried telling my son uh, not to vaccinate, and he's gone ahead and got my grandson's first set of um, vaccines now, and uh, everything seems to be okay, but I mean, who knows, time will tell. Um, after that, I thought about all that had happened to Kesa. Then I realised that I had trusted the wrong people. His father had been here the whole time. He suffers a lot. Our family was ripped apart for something he didn't do. He was the one accused of abuse, and he didn't do anything. It, it makes you wonder why they accused the father and not the mother. I mean, it, it's, it's, pro it's, it's better to get the father out of the way because the father will stand up to things, I think, more than the mother might. Uh, would, would, you, would that be normal, that it's generally the father that's accused? It's generally the father. It depends on what they're being accused of, but for shaken baby syndrome, it's usually the father. Um, but um, for mum's houses, it's usually the mother. Um, if you look at um, sort of... People, yeah, it's mostly fathers or male, a male caregiver um, that seems to be accused of shaken baby syndrome. Um, shaken baby syndrome does not exist. Um, Dr. John Lloyd has done some wonderful work on that. He's a biomechanic, and he's actually proven that it's impossible to shake a baby for the length of time that it would take to actually cause the bleeding to the brain. And also that um, they've done using they've done tests using crash dummies and all sorts um, which really do prove I mean I've seen the test for myself um, he's shown a very good video which you can find on um, a site called Amanda Truth Project if you look on that one you'll see if you look up um, 
Dr. John Lloyd on that particular website. Um, there's a very good video that, uh, and a conference that he gave in Canada, um, one that I saw when I was there, and he's given several since, um, proving that shaken baby syndrome does not exist. It, it's not actually physical, physically possible to shake a baby um, the length of time that would, it would take to to have a, a baby's um, brain bleed and also um, if, if, if you did shake a baby especially a very young baby of sort of four or five weeks um, the baby's neck and back would be broken through the violent shaking and these babies uh, are, are being you know parents that are being accused of shaken baby syndrome very often the babies have no other injuries but the triad of injuries in the brain and behind the eyes so therefore you know, if you shook a baby, I mean, I understand as to reason, you know, the, the force of the shaking would, would damage the neck and the back. And you would have bruising um, under the arms or on the torso where you've actually got the baby uh, and shook the baby that hard because you'd be holding the baby very hard to shake them. And it would take considerable force. Um, to shake a baby and but you know if you think of uh, some of these babies they're six months old that uh, uh, you know parents are being accused um, if you try and lift a baby of, of six months old and shake them at all it's practically impossible but to shake them for the length of time that they're supposed to be shaken is virtually impossible it, it's it's unheard of um, and he's proven it with um, various tests and various computer um, printouts and programs that he's used um, showing you um, you know he's had an actual sort of life-size dummy of a doll uh, you know at the same weight of a baby and got his staff various members of his staff including himself to shake the baby and um, the printout show that the, 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 the brain isn't damaged in any way um, I don't know if you've actually seen um, around Neil but there's actually um, uh, going around in America certainly that 11 year old it's year 7 uh, are being taught how to actually shake a baby uh, hard enough for the blip, their brain to bleed and they have to actually yeah, shake I, I saw that I saw that article the other day there. I think it was yesterday was it uh, that was posted. yeah I've actually put it around on Facebook a bit yeah. and then most most of the children in the class were horrified and didn't want to do yeah, it yeah they didn't want to do it and um, it's actually probably psychologically damaging to these children um, because they first of all they see a film with a parent so supposedly shaking a baby and they also see um, a film of how injured the child is a baby can be and they see t uh, children with terrible terrible disabilities from the shaking and yeah. I should imagine it's quite frightening to an 11 year old to see that yeah. Unfortunately, there were a couple of children in the class who quite enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. somebody, somebody, somebody wants to keep an eye on those ones uh, because they'll, <laughs> they'll probably end up being doctors. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to carry on with this a little bit more. There's not much of it left. Um, they took her son because he had injuries. Now, going back to just what you just mentioned there, um, fractured ribs, bruises, bleeding in the brain and damage behind his eyes. All of these injuries, including the fractured ribs, are caused from vaccines. Now, Going back to what you said, this this is a lady's own words. So she's done her she's done a bit of research now, and she's she's come to the conclusion um, based on evidence uh, that she's she's read up on. Um, I kept getting them vaccinated because I didn't know they could do these things. I was raised to think that vaccinations were good, that doctors and government officials are here to protect us, but I've seen that that I was taught wrong. Uh, I I can't have contact with his foster parents. I don't know them. The visit is at my home. We only get to see our son once a week for two to four hours. We had a major drug bust in our town recently, so DHS is always busy now. I mean, is that is that the Department of uh, Homeland Security or uh, the uh, the, <laughs> the hospital? I don't know. I don't know what she's talking about there. I mean, as I say, it's the same acronym. Department of Health. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, our amount of visitation depends on their availability. Um, not, not the availability of the child, obviously. Um, it is hard. I cry every time I have to let him go again. It's hard to see his room ready for him, but he's not there. The GHS worker that brings him over wants to, us to have him back. Now, that, that's, that's a, there's obviously some good people in there um, who understand what's going on. But again, um, you know, they, they're thinking about the paycheck. They're not prepared to put their heads above the parapet and say, well, actually, um, that other DHS worker has uh, made the whole story up. You know, um, our story helps someone. My son should have never been taken. I now know many families go through this. Our ch children deserve better. They need to be protected. And she, she finishes by saying, please don't vaccinate your children. They don't deserve to suffer the pain that comes with vaccine. 
Um, this page was made for our son, uh, Bring Baby Caser Home. I wanted to ask everyone to please like this page. I plan on using this page to show him later on in life what happened, and through it all, people cared for him. Um, so, I mean, these people still haven't got their child back and are still being um, blamed for his injuries. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, I have read that story myself, and it was very sad. Um, there's so many around at the moment. We've got the new website from Health Impact News. It's a sort of subsite of Health Impact News um, called Medical Kidnap, and I'm like, writing on my on that site myself at the moment. I've written one, which was the Ella story, but I've, I'm also writing other stories. I've been asked to do um, another one that's coming to, to, to the site and um, ask for help. Um, so I'll be writing on that one. Um, as I say, I've also got one film has gone up on that site and there'll be another film coming out very soon. So I am trying to, to do as much as I can to highlight these clay, um, cases, as is um, Terry, the other girl, the, the girl that actually runs the site uh, for Health Impact News. And, um, you know, I know she's working around the clock with these parents and every day more and more and more parents are coming in and she's overwhelmed with the amount of babies that have been vaccinated, have been damaged and where the babies have been stolen by social services and parents have either been jailed or, you know, have a terrible time trying to get their child back. Okay, just before we go to another piece of music, I'll just finish off on this story. We talked about um, doctors actually knowing that vaccines injure people um, and we mentioned earlier the grandmother had, had mentioned after the event as such that uh, vaccines could cause damage uh, it says Rebecca's grandmother advised her that Caser's injuries were known to be caused by vaccines these injuries have been well documented and are noted on vaccine package inserts so I, I mean again going back to what we mentioned right at the start the doctors know this stuff uh, is in the inserts and they know the consequences of what they're doing um, but not once did any of the doctors inform Caser's parents about vaccine injuries. And I think this, this, this says it all, really. Instead, they were denied, and Caser continued to be assaulted by them, meaning the doctors continued to assault them and cause the injuries. And again, it's, it's criminality. It's, it's, that's the only word for it. Yes, that's, that's right. Um, it is it's, it's terrible what goes on. Um, I just, we just can't believe how many, how many cases there are. Every day I get more and more, more cases coming into to me um, because I'm writing on this particular subject. But there are so many cases out there. You only have to go on Facebook and you'll see so many parents ple you know, asking for help after their child's been vaccinated and been damaged. Yeah, I, I, um, I read a, an article um, a few weeks ago um, from experimentalvaccines.org with uh, Kenny Valenzuela, who I've had on the, the broadcast before, and uh, he put out one saying that they're, they're using dog kidney cells now to um, cultivate, um, to, to culture um, vaccines now. So uh, basically he's saying get, get ready for all the, um, the allergies to, to pets that are going to come down yes, the line. Yes, I, I wrote about that not so long ago. Um, I think it was last year, um, the single mumps vaccine has is, is got um, the dog kidney cells in and um, there's been reported reactions of being allergic to dogs um, after the vaccination and becoming allergic to pets, uh, in particular dogs. So um, that was that was one of the articles I wrote last year. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's happening all the time. The, the ingredients seem to be getting more and more gross by the minute. Um, yeah. You know, everything from rats, dogs, cats. I mean, I mean, there's so many things that are in vaccinations. Cows, um, DNA from pigs. Chickens. Yep, chickens. I mean, why do we have to have all these things and what, what purpose do they serve? I guess, I guess they put the chickens in so they can say... We've got bird flu now. I don't, I don't know, um, but uh, the uh, the the vaccine that um, Kenny was talking about was the flu vaccine. It's this apparently this season's flu vaccination in America. Um, so get ready, get ready for all these pensioners suddenly having to get rid of the poodles and stuff because uh, they can't stand to be around them anymore. Um, okay, um, we've got another piece of music. Anybody, and uh, on, for anybody that's listening, I mentioned cats. I haven't seen any cats. Um, yeah. DNA or anything in it um, in vaccinations. I just happened to mention that, but um, all the rest. I mean, certainly all the rest of the um, animals I mentioned definitely are included in vaccinations, and um, it, it, it's not right. Um, I mean, I can't see any any real reason for these. Um, you know. 
these things to be put into vaccinations, um, along with all the gross ingredients, other other ingredients that they seem to be including in vaccinations these days, from aluminium to formaldehyde. Uh, you've got just so many things. There's borax, uh, which is known to be in that. Uh, human, human diploid cells. That's yeah, one. that's right. We've got those as yeah. well, yes. Yeah, we just we need DNA from other people in our bodies. That's, that's exactly what we need, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, um, well, I mean, that, that in itself, they've got, uh, let's say, they've got um, human diploid cells in there which, which contain DNA from people that, which doesn't match our DNA, and yet we're told we can't get a blood transfusion to, unless the type matches. So, I mean, that, yeah, that's, that exactly. says it all. There's no logic to it whatsoever, um, apart from the, the animal uh, DNA. You're listening to Awake Radio. Straight talk for the awake and aware. Okay, we're into the last half hour of uh, Rally Bites Radio for this evening, 17th of November 2014, with our guest Christine England. Uh, now, I'm slightly um, deviating off the, uh, the the damaged children side of vaccinations, um, but there is there is another element to it, um, which has been well documented in the past, and uh, even by the people who were responsible for um, uh, coming out with the idea of vaccines in the first place back in the, the 1920s and stuff, that they, they could use this kind of thing to depopulate the planet. And I think uh, John Holdren uh, is another one, uh, Barack Obama's senior scientific advisor, who is still in office and who wrote the book Eco Science back in 1976-77 with um, Paul Ehrlich, another uh, eugenicist, um, who said that they could uh, use vaccination, they could poison the water, they could poison the food and poison the air. And uh, I think it's fair to say they've done all that uh, at the moment. And uh, depopulation is working very well uh, with the amount of cancers we see, the amount of uh, well vaccine-damaged children we see, um, etc. Um, so your article, Christina, um, the title of which, if I scroll up here, depopulation, could a speech from eight years ago hold the key to the rapid spread of Ebola? And uh, Ebola, it seems, has disappeared from the news uh, all of a sudden. Uh, n- nobody seems to have it anymore and um, it's just not a big deal. So wh- what's it all about, Christina, in your opinion? Well, um, certainly I don't know if, um, if who's listening, but um, in the UK, we've had the um, Band-Aid doing the recent Christmas, do they know it's Christmas, um, sort of um, CD, I'm sorry, I'm not with it really, <laughs> CD, um, that's just come out today, uh, came out at 8 o'clock this morning, um, and it's already got to number one, and this was raising money for the Ebola uh, so-called Ebola sort of epidemic or pandemic is now um, abroad. Um, they were sort of saying, that, you know, how exactly the, the Ebola, I mean, I saw it all on X Factor last night, um, uh, how the, the song was made and who was making the song. And um, basically, they were trying to raise money for the Ebola. Um, and the Ebola seems to, have, as you say, died down in the news a bit recently. Um, it's still spreading um, quite rapidly in um, West Africa, or supposed to be. Um, and I was talking about, um, there's been many questions about how it appears to be spreading and what's causing it. And I was asking whether it might be vaccinations, because um, obviously we know that the vaccinations uh, were used to spread the, the AIDS virus around. And we know that from um, a speech um, by Maurice Hillman, um, the, the former chief executive of Merck Pharmaceutical Companies. Um, he's been, he was in the vaccine division and his colleagues, because it was all leaked on the internet um, and we could hear them laughing um, and joking about the fact that they'd brought these green monkeys into uh, to, to use cells from the green monkey. I think it was the kidney cells from the green monkeys. And when they sort of transported them over, they realized that the monkeys had um, were carrying AIDS, uh, but they still went ahead and used the, um, used the cells anyway. And I've, 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 you know, sort of identified a piece of the speech. Um, and also, at the time, he admitted to um, giving the Americans um, contaminated vaccinations uh, that were contaminated with leukemia and cancer uh, viruses. Um, so this was all going ahead in Merck, and they were knowingly spreading these terrible diseases through use of vaccinations. 
And I was querying a speech that I found on the internet. And it was a speech of uh, a professor, Eric Pianka, who um, he received a standing ovation for his speech that he gave to scientists um, attending the 109th meeting of the Texas Academy of Science. And during the speech, he actually, um, it was actually a speech on um, population control. Um, there's been lots of speeches on population control and lots of um, different conferences around the world um, talking about the um, population control. And, um, I mean, we've all heard the one, I'm sure, on the internet, um, on YouTube, uh, where um, the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, Bill Gates was saying that, you know, they hope to um, control the population by the use of uh, vaccinations. And most people have heard that by now. Well, and John Ballantyne reported um, on another speech that was made um, by this Dr. Eric Bian Bianca. And he was saying that, um, I mean, you can read it out for yourself. I mean, it, it's very interesting what he did say. And he was actually sort of saying that he was, he, he was his chosen... Um, sort of method for depopulization or, uh, and lowering the population um, and he was saying that um, he would spread it if he could um, by the use of air, airborne Ebola and he was speaking into the camera about the airborne Ebola and, and the sort of um, the rapid sort of um, way that this could actually spread Ebola through the populations and um, cause um, a drop into the po drop in the population. And he was saying that they're looking to, to depopulise by about 90% um, of, of the population um, because he, he was sort of saying quite nasty things about, you know, that the um, human race was nothing more than bacteria and he he was sort of, he his speech was very very strong i have uh, sort of spoken about his, his speech in a little bit more detail in my article which i actually published on the um liberty beacon and explained you know my my views and my opinions on it um um and you know we've we've had several t attempts at um lowering the population using vaccine vaccines um with aids we've had um, also, use of um, fertility, vac infertility vaccinations, um, um, vaccinations laced with the HCG um, hormone, um, a hormone known to actually cause. Um, there is actually, a, um, it's when it's mixed with the tetanus vaccination, it can cause women to miscarry and uh, become infertile. And it's, it was, I mean, I've got papers um, also actually printed on the. Um, the Liberty Beacon showing um, the WHO discussing um, these ideas and lacing vaccinations with um, the HCG um, sort of hormone back in the 1992 and then three years later they were trying it out uh, for real in um, the Philippines and were found out by um, a group, an organisation um, connected with the Catholic Church and they were found to have these, they, when they tested the vaccinations, they were found to have, be containing the HCG hormone. Um, and this has been recently tried yet again on the people, um, the sort of young women of Kenya. And once again, they, they, they've been caught out and the vaccinations um, have been found to actually contain the HCG. And both times these were tetanus vaccinations and both times they were only given to young women between the ages of 14 and 45 uh, which are the, the the years which the woman is fertile and I mean in, in the um, the sort of um, speech that I was uh, talking about this time they were discussing how it might be an easy way of spreading Ebola by spreading it airborne um, and um, spreading it through the population. I suppose this could really be done through chemtrails or something like that. Um, and uh, after his speech, um, John Ballantyne actually was there and, and, and witnessed the speech. And he said that I watched in amazement as a few hundred members of the Texas Academy of Science rose to their feet and gave a standing ovation to a speech that enthusiastically advocated the element elimination of 90% of the Earth's population by Ebola. Um, well, 
Well, I mean, it would be nice if uh, 100% of those people went first, and then we could we could think about it. You know, if, if, <laughs> yeah. if, if, we got, if we got rid of the lunatics first, and then left yeah, the same, same nice people idea. behind. Yeah, left the same people behind, and then we can... Uh, it's, it's like, um, you know, the Green Movement talks about uh, depopulation, there's too many people. Well, you know, everybody in the Green Movement should um, show the courage of their convictions and uh, commit suicide, basically, if they really believe that, um, and not have any children whatsoever. But, of course, they do. And uh, the likes right. of um, Maurice Strong and uh, Warren Buffett and all those that advocate depopulation, they've all got five or six children. The Rockefellers, I think he's got six. You know, but um, it's, it's okay for them to have too many, but not us, of course. Uh, we, we're only allowed to have one. Uh, that's what they're striving for now. Um, I did see a speech um, when they were talking, when, when the Ebola thing was at its height. Uh, there was a conference held uh, on population, and some guy there, um, I, I can't remember his name, um, and I think he worked for one of the pharma companies. Um, just uh, off the cuff, it was, it was before the conference actually started. They just said, "Oh, if you, if you want to do something about um, overpopulation, we've got it now. It's Ebola. Let's let's do it." Yes, I think it's already been um, developed in factories and pharmaceutical companies, and the the virus has already been developed, and um, it's basically, uh, in my opinion, a chemical. It's, it's used as sort of a chemical or buy a weapon to drop on the population any time they wish to, just like um, there are other there are other nasty diseases um, that can be dropped o- onto us at any time um, to lower the population, um, and uh, um, it, it's all about control. And there's a lot of people that are into eugenics and controlling the population and deciding who lives and who dies. And these are usually the people, the elite, right at the top. Um, people like um, Bill Gates, I mean, Bill Gates' father was into eugenics and, um, you know, it's it's very much a way of controlling the population growth. And um, yeah, I think, personally, this is my opinion, um, don't quote me, but this is my opinion, that they're trying it out on the um, sort of the third world or, you know, developing countries. Uh, to to see how it goes, to see how it, how it would work and how it plan, plans out because um, they class the, the developing countries as, as countries that, you know, who's going to miss them anyway. Um, and this is a very sad way of looking at life. Um, but this is, this is what I've seen um, writing the articles, certainly writing the articles on Chad, how easy um, these people are to disappear and never, be, never to be seen again and who'd miss them. Uh, because I mean, I would never have heard of the, the Chad incidents and what went on with the um, Menafrak vaccine, the meningitis A vaccine, um, in a small little village in Guru, Africa, if it hadn't have been for somebody coming to me and emailing me. Um, and then I, it would never have leaked onto the internet if it hadn't been for a brave relative managing to get hold of me. Um, when he was working in uh, the Nojima, which is the capital of of, um, of Chad. And, um, you know, so if I had never uh, managed to get that story, um, no one would have known that the 500 children were locked into a school and forced vaccinated against their will and how the 106 became ill. No one would have ever have known about the children becoming paralyzed and all these kinds of things. So, um, and we've just had um, incidents where three very brave women have um, written a, a writ petition into the Supreme Courts of India um, on the HPV vaccinations. Again, um, this involved uh, the Bill Gates Foundation and um, PATH, UNICEF, uh, CDC, Gavi, all these kinds of people were involved in it. And it was about the testing of the HPV vaccines on tribal women in, um, in India uh, to, you know, very early on, uh, before the, the vaccination was actually released, and how many women of these women had died, and how many women had become terribly disabled and ill after the vaccination, but no checkups, no um, sort of look, looking back to see if any of them had a, had a, an injury. There was no feedback on it at all, and the whole program was um, deemed a success. Um, and yet, well, they, they actually stated that most, as another article I've written, that most of the women hadn't actually, um, well, they were young girls, they were actually children um, between the ages, I think, of 9 and 17 that, that were involved in these tests. And um, 
they hadn't even had their parents given give consent um, because most of the consent forms had been signed with either a thumbprint of from illiterate parents that didn't understand what the forms were saying anyway or they were signed by the wardens of the um, institutions where the women or children were living. Yeah, well, I actually mentioned this article, uh, another um, case in India, uh, which I read out on Thursday, actually, about the sterilization camps uh, in India, yeah. where, where this, this doctor had operated on, I think it's, uh, it says in here, uh, yeah, 83 women uh, between the ages of 26 and 40 were operated on in just six hours. And it is, the average term of his, uh, time of his operations were five minutes. And uh, a lot of these women, had, I think it's 20 had died or so, or quite a, quite a number had died, and, and many of them were um, kind of uh, on their last legs, as it were, as well. And Oh, yes, you know, that was the sterilization camp, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they just round these women up and put them in a camp, and this guy goes to work on them. It's, I mean, it's, also, it's almost like Klaus Barbie. It's just, it's totally barbaric. And, uh, yeah. you know, we, we, and we're supposed to turn a blind eye to this kind of thing. Uh, but, of course, that's the BBC uh, report now, and they're probably gloating over this and enjoying every minute of it. But um, you mentioned um, Bill Gates, and of course, uh, you know we've seen in Pakistan in particular, and I'm, I'm, I think in India as well, where the the so-called um, health workers have been attacked and, and run out of town basically because they, they know full well what these guys are doing, um, and uh, of course they, they blame the Taliban and all, and any other spurious group that they want to make up uh, for for the fact that. Um, people are intelligent and they, they can see that their children are being killed uh, and they're being sterilised. But um, this, this one is one you wrote uh, back in October, uh, October the 5th. Uh, India holds Bill Gates accountable for his vaccine crimes. Yeah, now, so uh, this is the carry on from the article I was just talking about where um, these girls had been, the tribal girls in India, and um, these three brave women had taken... Um, had written a writ petition and it actually got um, it actually managed to get heard by the Supreme Courts of India and uh, Bill Gates is now going to, you know going to be sued for his crimes and there's a lawsuit against Bill Gates at the moment so it's, it's for, for once he looks as if he might uh, be held ac accountable for some of his crimes um, whether whether that happens or not who knows I mean he's a powerful man he's got a lot of money. Um, whether they, they actually win this, we don't know. Um, of course, you know, he's connected with all the big groups like UNICEF and Gavi. He funds an awful lot of them. I mean, he even funds um, some of the um, programs going on with the Hallmark cards. I don't know if you know about the Hallmark cards, but Hallmark, no. Hallmark cards are actually um, sending out... Um, cards to all new all new uh, mothers and fathers and parents in um, uh, the USA at the moment um, with a vaccination table in and a vaccination um, you know program to what when their child should be vaccinated congratulating them on the birth of the vaccine uh, sorry sorry congratulating on the birth of the baby and then sending a vaccine chart and a growth chart and everything and making sure Sure, you have your child vaccinated on time, etc., etc. Um, so the card is loaded with, you know, uh, Psycho and, psychology, uh, psychology, basically. Yeah, it is psychology, and it's to get, make sure that these children are vaccinated. And who's behind it? Um, you find if you if you research enough, you'll find Bill Gates is all behind it, and he's actually funding Walmart cards. Yeah, well, I mean, any, anybody who looks at uh, Bill Gates even, you know, scratches the surface. I mean, as, as you mentioned earlier, his father was a eugenicist, and his father uh, founded Planned Parenthood, of which Bill Gates is heavily involved in today. Uh, and he founded that with Margaret Sanger, who who said mm -hmm. that um, we, we, we can't let it be known that we want to wipe out the black people. Um, and here's Bill Gates, apparently, in, in Africa and India, uh, vaccinating people against polio and then causing... What was it, 48,500 cases of polio in India alone at, at one yes, stage? Yes, uh, that was um, it's vaccine-induced polio. Um, yeah, they caused... Um, they, they, they're saying that they've got rid of the... You know, they, they're sort of um, making the wild polio extinct and, and that, that, that polio doesn't exist anymore. But all they've done is replaced it with um, a vaccine-induced polio um, and this has caused uh, 47,500 children. Um, and this, these were the figures last year. They're probably a lot higher now um, to actually suffer from, um, 
this vaccine induced polio and that yeah, these it, it children are now it suffering with the, with the polio. Yeah, it, as um, as say, it doesn't actually exist anywhere in the world apart from in Bill Gates' vaccines. No, that's right. Um, and these children are all now suffering from this. Um, but this is all covered up because of the fact that um, it's not the wild polio. You know, that's all gone. That's eradicated. That's been, you know, um, wiped out, according to Bill Gates. But, you know, um, these children are suffering from the vaccine-induced polio instead. Um, and not only that, I mean, you know, you've got... In India alone, I mean, I've, I've actually written this and actually got the, the numbers of the, the vaccines and what vaccines they're getting. And the children in India have um, 23 doses of polio by the time they're five. Uh, I mean, that, that is absolutely ridiculous. 23 doses of polio before the age of five because they get... How, how do they try and um, justify that? I mean, uh, supposedly well, a vaccine works when you get it, that's it. Why do you have to have another 22 of them? Yeah, they're, they're just vaccinating and vaccinating and vaccinating. What they're doing is they're giving them the um, polio drops and also they're giving them the um, the, the vaccinations, um, the polio vaccination uh, into, into the muscle. Um, and so these children are getting all of these different vaccinations um, that they don't need and they're getting the... Bollywood stars and um, superstars like uh, David Beckham. I mean, he's just done been over there and helped with a uh, polio program uh, to vaccinate the children in front of audiences. Um, these children are being given the um, drops. They're not actually given the vac vaccines themselves, but they've been given the polio drops, which have been banned in the USA and banned in m many countries because of their dangers. And uh, all they do is they ban the vaccines in the UK, the USA, Canada, Australia, pr probably Japan as well in some cases. And then they just ship them all over, uh, all over to the, the developing countries and give them out there. Yeah, I, I did hear that they tried to blame it, uh, all these um, cases, on the, the fact that these vaccines were made in India and they weren't actually um, legitimate vaccines and stuff. Uh, they were contaminated by whatever process that had been used to develop them. Um, but um, in, in the case of Bill Gates, I mean, his, his vaccines have presumably travelled thousands of miles um, to get to India. And uh, as far as I'm aware, also, they have to be kept refrigerated at all times. Uh, and they're going to a very, very hot climate, and uh, I'm sure they're uh, they're not fresh by the time they get there. And uh, any any live viruses that are in these things, obviously in in heat, will um, grow and become even more virulent. And um, possibly that's one explanation as to why these people are getting all these diseases. Who knows? It's very possible, um, especially when you consider, I mean, certainly with the Menafrac, the meningitis A vaccine, they were trying to develop a vaccine that could cross the cold chain and um, actually be kept um, without refrigeration. However, what they didn't see, um, what they didn't look at, was the fact there was two parts of this vaccine and one part of the vaccine did need to be kept at a, a, a lower temperature than the other and they didn't take this into consideration. So the fact when the vaccines were mixed together, um, as they're supposed to be, the two halves were mixed together, uh, they were already, you know, not fit for, for humans to have. Well, I know vaccines aren't anyway, but these particular vaccines were particularly dangerous, um, and that's the consequences were um, all these children remained paralysed. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it's the same thing, but... Uh, I did see stuff uh, years ago on on food um, from the likes of the UK and um, many other countries that, that was going out of date, and they shipped it off to like Africa and uh, India and other other Asian countries or whatever, and uh, left it sitting out and like chicken and stuff like that, just left it sitting on a on a pier in a container for for like hours, and then they, then they fed it to people, yeah. they, refro they refroze it and sold it, and uh, I, you know I, why would why would they do any different with that? Vaccines, you know, they, they, they don't care about people. They don't care if people get sick. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure somebody in the Indian government, um, and just my opinion, is getting paid very, very heavily for signing these contracts for all these vaccines that are going in. If you say like every every child's getting 23 of them, that's that's an awful lot of money. Yes, that's right. It is a lot of money, and um, they are getting paid a lot of money to do to, to commit some terrible crimes. And of course, many of the people. Um, 
are, are just in it for the money, I think. You know, they don't really care what they do to the people. Um, as I said before, um, these people um, are not going to be noticed if they're missed, um, you know, if they, if they die, sorry, they're not going to be noticed if they die. So, um, you know, who cares? But there are people that care. I care. Um, there's um, Ikatora, um, the human rights organization that writes for, um, big articles on, the, on this, this kind of thing. Uh, all the time trying to stop these crimes. Um, people do care. I mean, these children, um, they have parents, they have aunts and uncles and grandparents, they have brothers and sisters. And, and who, who has the right to play God um, other than God? What right has anybody to take their lives willingly, knowing what they're doing? Um, because, um, you know, these children do belong to somebody. They are somebody's family. And, you know, they've got every, every right to live just the same way as any child has. You know, no child is born to die. And they say this on the adverts, you see, no, no child is born to die. And yet, you know, they're vaccinating them with vaccinations that they shouldn't be vaccinating with because uh, they're banned in many countries around the world. Yeah, that's that um, that phrase. Uh, no child born to die. That's from one of the children's charity sites, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I thought of I thought of um, neuro linguistics when I read that the first time. It's it's almost like no child born today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, and I just that, that struck me as uh, something. And it's always the same symbol. It's the, the little man with the arms out at the start of the east or whatever it's called. But uh, anyway, that's uh, another issue. Okay, we've got um, five minutes to go or so. Um, what? What advice would you give any parent who, who goes into a doctor in the UK, for example, where you're based? Um, I mean, I, I said on radio a long time ago, on, on Irish radio again, uh, that um, I would suggest that regardless of what it was, whatever whatever drug, uh, whether it's for yourself or your child, whether it's a vaccine or painkillers or, or whatever, um, you, you say to the doctor, here's an indemnity form, um, I want you to sign this. If, if anything happens to my child or myself, I'm going to sue you personally and see what happens. I, I bet they don't sign it. No, um, Dr. Rebecca Carley has spoken about this many times. Um, she's got a very, very good um, uh, exemption form that she uses and gives that to parents. And um, no doctor's ever, ever signed it. And I think she's, she's been putting it out on the internet for about four or five years now. And there's been no doctor ever willing, ever been willing to sign this form. Um, the doctors won't, but they don't know what they're vaccinating the children with half the time. They've not looked up the information. They don't know themselves. So, um, you know, my advice to parents is um, I wouldn't say I, I haven't got the authority to say whether to vaccinate or not. I know what I mean. I know what I think. And I've got my opinions. Of course I have. But I would uh, always say to parents, uh, educate before you vaccinate you know, look up the information. The information's out there. There's some terrific sites. Uh, you've got Liberation Army. You've got um, many, many sites. You've got Back Truth. You've got um, the NIBC. There are many, many sites giving out um, true um, factual information on vaccinations. Um, I, think, I think it's one, one thing's important to, to find out is uh, what, what make of vaccine it is, what, what actual name it is. And then you can go in armed with the vaccine insert because you can get them online. And yes, if, the doctor, you can. if the doctor's not prepared to show you, then you say, well, actually, I've got a copy here. Uh, do you want to explain this to me? Since you've obviously not read it. You know? Yes, so that's it. The, they, the doctors haven't read them. They don't have the time to read them. And a lot of the doctors are paid per every, every vaccination they're giving their ch the children. They are being paid a certain amount for these vaccinations. I wrote an article years ago on that, how the doctors were being paid per vaccination um, and being given bonuses to hit targets. And this is why they, they, they sort of don't want you um, to not have the vaccinations and will take you off the list if, you, if they haven't, you know, you're not receiving the vaccinations for your children because, they, you know, it stops them getting their bonuses. Yeah, well, of course, they're now, they're now being paid up to £200 a time to diagnose somebody with dementia. Uh, I guess whether they've got it or not, they'll get their £200, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of um, drugs money comes in for that as well when the big pharma company starts uh, coming around with the uh, dementia drugs, um, which they've got to administer. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll finish on that note. And um, uh, can you just uh, stay, stay online? Uh, we've got this piece of music and we'll talk to you off here. 
Okay, that's brilliant. Thank okay, you. Thank, thanks very much, Christina, for your time and uh, the information. Always uh, informative, and uh, the chat room has been very busy. Um, talking about all the stuff you've been going through, I haven't had time to reply to any of it, but um, I'll have a I'll have a look back at that. Um, thanks again, and uh, we'll finish off with a piece of music, whatever Paula has lined up. Don't act so surprised, Princess Liar Exposer. You weren't on any mercy mission this time. Several transmissions were beamed to this station by awake people. I want to know what happened to the messages they sent you. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a member of the Wake World, an exposure mission to free the world from tyranny. You are part of the Rebel radio station and a traitor. Take her away. Awake Radio bringing you information the Tyrannic do not want you to hear. Tune into awakeradio.us, wakeradio.co.uk.